Okay, so imagine you are on the moon. Yes, that'd be pretty cool. And you have a baseball, and so you're going to throw that baseball. Um, so they didn't actually do that on the moon, but we can pretend. And, and I like the moon because I have this awesome picture. And number two, there's no air, so you don't have to worry about it. And it's different than Earth, so it's a little, you know, just mix things up. So this is a picture from Apollo 17, and they did not throw a baseball, but that's fine. I'm going to use this picture anyway. So let's start with a ball on the moon. Now, I'll go ahead and tell you, my goal here is to show you how to do this calculation as a means to kind of promote the work energy principle, which we'll use in another video. So in this case, I'm not going to use the work energy principle. And if you say, hey, you should use work energy principle, you're right. But this is a, this problem is to show you that you should. Okay, so I throw the ball up. It has a mass of, I just, I just picked this 150 grams of so 0.15 kilograms and it starts at a position of zero and these this is the this is the vector notation I use uh, it's from matter and interactions I just like it so you have these XYZ coordinates uh, components of the position they're all zero meters uh, the ball is thrown with a velocity of 10 meters per second in the Y direction and I could calculate the momentum so the momentum, and I'm calling this the initial momentum, is the mass times the initial velocity. Uh, and that's how we define momentum if the object's not moving near the speed of light, which is not here. So a little bit, as I throw it, it's going to be moving up, and it's going to be going slower as it goes up because there is a downward pulling gravitational force on it. The gravitational force due to the moon is the mass of the ball times its gravitational field, g. And on the moon, g has a value of 1.63 newtons per kilogram in the negative y direction uh, as opposed to earth it'd be 9.8 newtons per kilogram and if you take a newton as a kilogram meter per second squared and you divide by kilograms this is the same as a meter per second squared i kind of like it better as uh, a newton per kilogram but i just want to show you that it is indeed the same thing so i want to find out how high this ball goes so it's going to keep going up until it gets to the highest point where the momentum is zero at the highest point, it's going to start coming back down, but it has to get to zero uh, vector momentum or at least zero y component of momentum, and then it's going to start moving down. And I want to find this height, which I will call R2, 0, H0. I want to find that value of H. And, and I'm throwing this ball straight up. I don't care about the x direction. Okay. And again, remember, I'm doing this as an example of how to to show you that the work energy principle would be better. So yes, I'm not using the work energy principle. I'm going to use the momentum principle. So the momentum principle says that the net force on an object is equal to the change in momentum divided by the change in time. And if I look at the starting momentum and the final momentum, that'd be P2 minus P1 divided by delta T. So I can write the net force as only one force acting on that ball, and it is the downward gravitational force Mg. Now note, if I write g as a vector, it has a negative y component. Don't put negative g, okay? It's g. Um, but I do get a negative here because p2 is a zero vector, so I get zero minus p1, so there is a negative sign there. Now, I only need, there's a problem here. If I want to solve for like delta t, I couldn't because you'd have to divide a vector by a vector, which you can't. So instead, I'll just use the y direction. So if I'm just in the y direction, then I can replace p1 with m v1y in, in the y direction and the y component of the gravitational force is negative mg and that's the, the scalar g of 1.63 and the mass is canceled so I get this negative g equals negative v1y divided by delta t and I can solve that for delta t okay now because if I and again if I left that as a vector I'd have a vector over vector and it's just awkward okay it's like what okay so I'm gonna I did it as a y component so then I can also find, use the definition of the average velocity in the y direction as the change in y divided by the change in time. But there's another definition of the average velocity, and it's v1 plus v2 over 2. So you can actually take the initial velocity and the final velocity and add them and divide by 2 and get the average. That works if the net force is constant, which we do have a net constant net force here. So I can solve this equation. I can say delta y is h, right? It's going to be, uh, that's the final position, the initial y position was 0, and I can multiply both sides by delta t, and I get h equals v1y delta t over 2, because v2 is 0. And then I can substitute in my expression for delta t equals uh, v1y over g, and I get v1y squared divided by 2g. And that's how high it goes. And so now I can plug in my values, and I get 
h equals 30.67 meters. Now, what if, since I already did the problem and I put the numbers in at the end, what if I put in a different initial velocity? What if I put initial velocity of 500 meters per second? Well, the math is the same. All I have to do is put in new numbers at the end, and I get this. So now I get 76 kilometers high, okay? And we're like, wait, does that still work? Okay, let's look at the different kinds of gravity that we have. So we have real gravity. Um, no, that's not real gravity. That's a baseball. So the, if I have this ball at a height h, and I say it has a downward gravitational force mg, that's just an approximation. That's not real gravity. Okay. Really, I have a ball from the center of the moon, a height h above the surface, with a downward gravitational force pulling on it. That ball is a distance r from the center of the moon, and the radius of the moon is rm. So really, that r is r radius of the moon plus h. Okay, And now I can use the real gravitational formula of negative g, where g is a gravitational constant. I'll show you that in just a second. Mass of the moon, mass of the ball, divided by the distance between the ball and the center of the moon squared. And then that r hat just means I can get it back into a vector, because I don't want to leave that not as a vector. Okay, so let's just see how these two forces compare, these two models of Kalkin, the gravitational force, as I move from zero meters above the surface of the moon to 76 meters above the surface of the moon. So here I can use the gravitational constant of g equals 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th newtons kilograms squared per meter squared, the mass of the moon 7.347 times 10 to the 22nd kilograms, and the radius of the moon. Uh, and that just matters because I need to add that to my height. So the blue line in this graph is the gravitational force mg, so it doesn't change as you get higher. The red one decreases as you get higher, and you can see it goes from, I actually get a different value at zero because of, I rounded, but it's close enough. It goes from 1.63 down to about 1.48. So it does decrease, not a huge amount over that distance, but it does indeed decrease. So now I have a problem. Right. So I want to actually find out how high this ball goes, but I don't have a constant force. So how do you deal with a changing force? Well, here's my new momentum principle. F net is still delta P over delta T, but my net force depends on the position R. And the position changes with momentum. So it's kind of a it's kind of a circular problem here, and that makes it kind of complicated. So when things are complicated, we cheat. And we cheat by saying, well, what if I take a small time interval? If I say delta t is very small, then I can say the gravitational force is fairly constant. And this is the idea behind a numerical calculation. So what we're going to do is, one, you break this problem into a small time step and calculate the force. Use that force to update the momentum, all of the same small time step. Update the position with that same time step, and then update time, move to the next time interval, and then keep doing this again and again and again until I get what I want. And this is the idea of a numerical calculation. Repeat this over and over and over again. So how do I update the momentum? Well, if you look at F net equals delta P divided by delta T, I can solve for P2. Okay, I'll skip the algebra. I've done it a couple times. So that means that if I take the initial momentum, add F net plus times delta T, that would be the new momentum. And remember, this works if delta t is small. And it actually does work. And then I can use the same idea for average velocity, which I can call p over m is the velocity. Multiply by delta t, add that to the old position, and then I get my new position. And here you'll see there's actually a trick. Okay, I'm going to use not the average momentum, which I should be using. I'm going to use the final momentum. But again, if my time interval is small, that's just a small mistake, and it should be OK. And, and it, I just don't want to add any extra steps if I don't have to. Um, it, it should work well enough, trust me. And then I need to update time, and that's what I'm going to do. So how do I do all this stuff? If you've seen any of my videos, you'd know, hey, this is where he goes into Python. Yes, I'm going to do this in Python from scratch, and I'm going to switch over to Python right now. I'll see you there. OK. I know I got started without you. I apologize, but I was just very excited. So let me I'll just put some things in here. Let's just go over what's here already. This is just to make a graph. Uh, and in fact, I need to add another thing. F1 equals G curve. Color equals color dot blue. And then I have the gravitational constant, the mass of the moon, radius of the moon. Here's some notes here. If you remember um, putting a 
number sign in front of a line makes it a comment. So these are just the notes here because it, it was when I launched it at 500 meters per second, I got 76 kilometers. I just want to check. Um, then I have the mass of the ball and the velocity of the ball. So now I need the momentum of the ball. So P equals M times V, MB times V. Uh, so you'll notice here I'm not using labels. It's not V1, P1, and stuff like that. Um, so I, I don't have to do that. I can change that value of the velocity. That's what's truly really nice in Python. And and I'll point out also here that this is trinket.io. It's a online Python. Uh, so it doesn't, uh, you don't have to install anything. It works pretty well. Okay, uh, now I need to calc, I need the time, t equals zero, and the time step. Let's go with uh, 0 0.01, even though that might be too small. Um, eh, who cares? Okay, Th let's start this off in a simple way. So I can say while t is less than 10, okay, which is not going to be the right answer. I'm going to need to run it longer than that. And so I need to first calculate the force, right? So I'm going to say, um, let's say r equals, um, I'm just trying to think, I'm going to throw this in the y direction, okay? So it's going to be the vector um, 0 radius of the moon, 0, plus the vector r. Did I put r? No, I didn't. Plus r. And I'll go up here and say uh, r equals vector 0, 0, 0. Right, so now I'm get. oh, I did that wrong. Let's see, let's call this uh, um, altitude. <laughs> okay, so that's the altitude, and then R is the actual position with respect to the center of the moon. I don't like that, but I did it anyway. Okay, that, that works. Okay, now I can calculate the force. So I'll say F equals negative G, big G, G times mass of the moon, times mass of the ball, times the unit vector, normal r, right? So norm creates a unit vector. It is r hat, and I need that r hat because I need f as a vector. And you could do this problem in one dimension, but you'd be, you'd be shorting yourself out there. So then I need to divide by the magnitude of that vector r squared. So you, you can't square a vector, so I have to take the magnitude first. Now I can use that to update the momentum. So I can say p equals p plus F times GT. That's it. Okay. And I don't have P1 and P2 because I'm updating the value of P. I'm not I'm not calculating P2. I'm just changing the value of P. Now I need to update R. Uh, yeah. R equals R plus, um, I, I got, so let's say uh, P times GT divided by mass of the ball. Now I need to update time. T equals T plus dt. Uh, now I actually want to plot this before I update the time. So I'm going to say f1.plot and the x coordinate on that is going to be t and the y coordinate is going to be the y position of the ball. So let's do uh, r, let's do, hmm, I want to get the altitude again. Let's just do this. Let's say uh, r.y minus radius of the moon because then it'll plot the altitude. Okay, I think that's good. And let's save it. And, and run it. And it worked. Okay. So, uh, it did not work. Because why is it? It starts up at 5 and it's going down. See, R is RM plus altitude, which is 0. Why is it going down? P is mb times v. Why is it going down? It starts at 5. r dot y. Let's just plot r dot y. Huh. r dot y. So the time looks right. But why is it going down? So I have fg, unless my g value is too high, mb, mass of the moon, that looks good, gravity is 6.67 times to the negative 11th, norm r divided by mag r squared, p, p plus f dt, r equals r plus p times dt divided by m, hmm, 
That's really weird. Because the... Why is it starting at 5? Let's print up the position right here. Let's print. No, that doesn't make any sense. Let's print the first... This is print... Um, hmm. Print r.y minus rm. That's not going to help. This is, that was a bad idea. Why did I do that? I'm getting zero. Zero? Oh yeah, because it starts at zero. But it never changed. Uh, no, I did R. I'm changing R. Oh, I know why. Look up here. See, because I... Okay, I need... I, that was my mistake. Cut that out. Put that up here. Okay, I got it. So every single time I was putting the, the position back at the the surface of the moon, I had that in the loop. I do not want that in the loop. Okay, now it's going to work. Aha! <laughs> okay, so there we go. So now it's going to go up and up and up. Uh, is it at the highest point? No, it's not. It only went... 5,000 meters and each go a lot higher. So we could just keep on doing this, let's say, do it for 100 seconds. And you can see we're getting a little bend there. Okay. Uh, or we could do this until the y momentum is uh, no, as long as p dot y is greater than or equal to zero. And then we can do this. Uh, let's just print the final position. Print uh, r dot y minus. Uh, RM, just so we have the value. We want to compare that to the other one. There you go. And you'll see here that the slope of the line does indeed get to zero, and I get 80 kilometers. So it went higher with this new calculation. And I think we're done here, but I want to do something else, right? Because I want to go back up here and change this to 10 meters per second. And it should give me 30.767 or whatever I had before. Let's do it that way. Look at that. Okay, that's not exactly the same, but I think it's close because I actually, uh, if I if I increase, if I make this time step a little bit smaller, yeah. Oh, well, that's weird. It's still giving me the a little bit. Oh, you know what? That's why because I rounded up here in these numbers, and so I had a slightly different gravitational field based on that rounding. I shouldn't round it, but that's it. I'm happy. Okay. Uh, if you want, you could. Just for fun, you could plot uh, velocity versus position. Uh, and let's just do that real quick. So let's change this back to 500. Oh, no, no, that's what I want to do. Let's change this to uh, 1,000. And change this to that. Run it. It's going to take a lot longer to run. But you'll notice it goes a lot higher. Look how high it's going. It's going 375 kilometers. And what would happen, you can't do this. Uh, let me print this time. Because I want to show you something cool. I want to print the final time. Okay, the time is 8.03 seconds. So now I'm going to go up here and say while t is less than 1,000 seconds. And I'm going to change this to uh, 1,500. And let's run it then. I can't, I can't. I gotta be careful, okay? If I do while the momentum is greater than zero, I can get myself into a situation where it never stops running. Because the thing is that if I change this to, uh, let's say, I can't remember what the value is, let's say 4,500, and this changes to 3,000 seconds. You'll notice here, it's not slowing down, okay? You can get to the point where you're so far away that the gravitational force gets too tiny to affect the thing, and it won't even get it to slow down, and it will never slow down all the way to zero. It will never reach the highest point, and that's escape velocity. And you can see that here. We're going to do it again in another video. I'm setting you up because I want to show you how much easier this is using the work energy principle, and that will be another video, and I'll talk to you guys later.